Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Fleming. I'm director of the Des Moines Arts Center. It's my great pleasure to have you here. In 2019, as I hope you have seen, the Fingerman Lecture, our ongoing lecture series established and funded through the generosity of Lou and Lois Fingerman, who are here tonight. Um, it, yes. It is now in its 30th year. It focuses not on one lecture, but on four lectures by four US museum directors. They're introducing topics and points of discussion related to the role of museums today. And certainly these include notions of inclusion and history. An example of this is our land acknowledgement statements that we sometimes use before public programs. And it reads, the land on which we gather is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded land of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, the Iowa tribe of Oklahoma, and the Meskwaki Nation of the Sauk and Fox tribe of the Mississippi. This afternoon, the Art Center is honored to welcome Franklin Sermons. He is the director of the Prez Art Museum in Miami. It's a modern and contemporary art museum similar to our own. It's dedicated to collecting and exhibiting international art of the 20th and 21st century. He has created a vital institution in his hometown, and it's certainly an integral part of the dialogue surrounding international art today. Prior to his appointment at the Perez, he was the, depart he was the department head of and curator of contemporary art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And from 2006 to 2010, he was the curator of modern and contemporary art at the Manil Collection in Houston. And he was also the artistic director of Prospect 3 New Orleans from 2012 to 2014. So please welcome now Franklin Sermon. Hi. Good evening. Thank you, Jeff. Um, also, thank you, Lois, Lou. Thank you for having me in this uh, program. Um, you know, uh, many of you have seen them, but a quick glance at the list, and you see why one would want to accept to be a part of the Fingerman Lecture Series. Um, we, we were fortunate enough to have share a little meal, and, uh, and I was listening to of some of your thoughts on, on, on one of the greatest lectures, which was Ed Ruscha. And God, I cannot follow Ed Ruscha, but, <laughs> but I'm gonna try. Um, I also, I, again, thanks Jeff and, and Jill Featherstone, thank you very much um, for everything. Uh, and Allison Ferris, and everybody at the Des Moines Art Center, thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to walk around with Jeff a little bit today, and you guys have a, a, an amazing institution here, obviously. So I'm honored and, and, and really um, excited about speaking with you for a little bit. I brought, as I tend to do, I think I still like rely um, on a curatorial mindset which says images and more is more, or more is, is best. And, and so there are a bunch of images in here. Some of them I'm gonna sit on, some of them I won't. Um, but hopefully it, it does something in terms of a visual conversation um, that I hope uh, is, is, is interesting. Um, the opportunity to think about some of those things that Jeff mentioned is uh, a, a wonderful um, place to be. I think sometimes, you know, especially um, Having been in the director position now for almost four years, there are times when you, know, you get away from the conversations that are most important and the conversations that brought you into the institution in the first place. And so every now and then you need a colleague to, to say, think about this in a, in a deeper way. And, and that's what this um, opportunity is for me. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, some of the issues that, that Allison touched on in her talk and uh, really set up some of the recent events 
that have even led to conversations on why we would say, you know, recent um, issues in museums. And I think our museum has it's at some times collided with some of these issues. Sometimes we kind of just barely elide around these issues, um, but should offer some sort of uh, point of view in which to consider um, these kind of conversations. So I'm gonna start off with mission statement. Yeah, so give you a chance to, to read that for a second and think about that for a second. Cultural diversity defines and inspires our singular position in the world. Miami Dade is a unique collection of peoples and the arts are fundamental to who we are as a community. We therefore strive to reflect the diversity of our city's population in our permanent collections, exhibitions, education offerings, and public programs. And we recognize that this diversity is integral to our excellence and success. I think a lot of us are saying some of the same things in terms of museums nowadays, um, but we didn't necessarily begin in that place. Um, the museum in, in the scope of museums is relatively uh, new. You know, we, we began as an institution in 1984. Um, in some ways, we are in the midst of celebrating a 35th anniversary, but because we are in a brand new building, a lot of people believe we've only existed for the five years that we've been in our brand new building. So we've been trying to talk a little bit about history in the last year, and, and that's what I'm gonna try and uh, talk about a little bit. So you see here on the bottom left, uh, drugs being uh, confiscated. Um, top left, um, seen from uh, riots in Miami. Uh, and then on the right, uh, a scene from uh, the Mario boat lift. Um, in the period before the museum, this is the immediate period before the museum was established. And I think Joan Didion says, sums up some of the issues um, so well in this um, quote from her incredible book, Miami. And if you haven't read it, I highly, I highly recommend. I had not read it before moving there. And um, boy, did it help me understand things a lot better. Um, I don't know if that has played out the way I wanted to just yet, but definitely has been helpful. And basically what she's talking about is kind of a, a recipe for different things to happen, for different people to come together. And that's what we are striving to build off of now. But we come from a place where those kind of aspirations and desires were complicated, to say the least. <clears throat> the way Time Magazine saw it in 1981, it was Paradise Lost, right? This epidemic of violent crime, a plague of illicit drugs, a tidal wave of refugees have slammed into South Florida with destructive power of a hurricane. Well, art comes to the rescue at some point. Um, in 1983, or 1981 actually is when it began, the artist team, Christo and Jean-Claude, was invited to come to Miami to consider a project. Now, they had been working on a project in New York City from the 1970s until that time period, which is a project called The Gates, which only came to fruition maybe, what, 10 years ago? And they had been working on this project for years, trying to get it off the ground to, to do this large project that sweeps all the way through Central Park and did not have the um, backing of the New York City government until Michael Bloomberg came in and, and that basically gave them a green light. But, you know, there, that, that, because of that, we had the good fortune of them thinking about Miami. And Christo said it best, um, Miami's Central Park is Biscayne Bay, you know, so the water there is the equivalent of doing something at Central Park in New York. As, as, as Christo was thinking about this project, I think it's interesting to consider the idea of what contemporary art means in a place like this, where there is no, muse there is no large scale museum at the time. They were invited to come by a guy named Jan Vandermark, who was the founding director of our museum, which at that time was called the Center for Fine Arts. 
And what you're seeing here is this pink um, wrapping that they did called Surrounded Islands. 11 islands inside Biscayne Bay going for about five miles were covered with this, this pink tarping. And in effect, creating almost like a, a, a physical um, water lilies, if you will. Uh, a painting is how Christo talked about it at times. And, and you can see um, here is a little bit of, of the kind of uh, preliminary experience. This is a project that once, once they agreed to do it in 81, took two and a half years to come to fruition and opened in the Bay in May of 1983. And, and, and it's like, I think, many of these projects that are ephemeral, that they are so powerful, involve so many people, that it feels as if they existed for a much longer period of time than they did. This project only lasted for two weeks. It involved thousands and thousands of people, volunteers, um, uh, different uh, engineers who really took a look at the islands in the bay and considered all of the wildlife that already existed in order to bring the project to fruition. But what I, what I really find so interesting is the, the thousands of people who decided that they were actually going to volunteer on this project. Um, and, and I'm gonna play a clip so you'll get a little bit of what reaction was like around that time. But to me, there is this essence in this project that speaks to contemporary art in a place that, that didn't have a, a museum uh, like this, as I mentioned, you know, even at the point of 1980, we're standing here in this beautiful, beautiful three different buildings that make up the museum that began in 1948. And, and, and to think that in, even in 1980, you know, Miami was a, a city, it's a little bit different um, than, than the rest of the country. But to consider contemporary art as this thing that brings people together, I think is, is the big testament um, of what this work is all about. Um, 1983, Christo, 1984, Miami Vice. <laughs> Equally important in the cultural sphere, um, Miami Vice signaled not only new ways of thinking, new, new ways of considering imagery and its relationship directly to music, um, Michael Mann, who was the producer behind that project, you know, you, they spoke about it in terms of MTV and, and in terms of shortened um, spans for people to take culture in. These are all the things that we're thinking about and talking about in the space of the museum. And it was highly successful. And ironically, although it was about violence, crime, there were those things that were integral to the show, it set forward a kind of idea of Miami that, that, that created an imaginary that made it very, very cool in a way. And I think that we continue to live off of this, right? Every year, the Miami heat uh, takes over the pink and blue colors of Miami Vice. I mean, this is a thing. We've, we've, we've taken this thing to heart and it, it's meaningful. The Miami Marlins recently changed their colors to pink and blue. So it, it's a fascinating backdrop. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play a little clip. Crime in Miami is up and tourism is down. When tourism is down, so is South Florida's economy. The city looks peaceful and prosperous from here. A new luxury hotel over there at Brickell Point. Construction cranes on the skyline over there at Ball Point. But tourism officials are deeply worried and they held an emergency meeting this morning to try to map plans to revive the flagging tourism business. They want to make Miami paradise regained as opposed to what Time Magazine this week calls paradise lost. Miami in 1980 and 81 was a rough and tumble place, kind of raw around the edges, but so exciting. 
a city that was kind of finding its identity, fighting crime, trying to assimilate 125,000 Cubans. There had been the Mariel boat lift. This was in the Miami that I grew up in Puerto Rico thinking of the, 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 the Miami of Frank Sinatra, the Morris Lapidus, the Fontainebleau Hilton, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., Bonnie Yeager. I arrived to a Miami that have sort of like forgotten its past. And suddenly this artist and his wife, I mean, this couple came along and said, hey, we want to put some pink cloth around the islands in Biscayne Bay. And people generally said, what? I mean, for what reason? And we became like giant flowers floating in that water for 14 days. Almost like real water lily, instead to be green, they will be pink and the, uh, the tree will be acting like a flower. Using six and a half million square feet of beautiful floating pink fabric on the surface of the water. Why pink? Why iridescent pink especially? <laughs> you know, uh, probably this is one of the most painterly projects I ever do. Painterly? It, yes. So that gives you a, a, a sense for that specific time and place. Jan van der Mark was a very special um, curator and director and was, was, was affiliated with, with the Midwest, um, worked at Walker Art Center, and uh, actually was the founding director at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. And in 1969, wrapped the first MCA Chicago with Christo. So they had a very long and very deep relationship, which would lead him to say, OK, I'm going to come and do this big project with you, this large public project, in a place that, frankly, doesn't have that, uh, the ability to make that happen. Um, Vandermark also then left uh, the museum, left our museum in 1986 to be the senior curator or chief curator at the Detroit Institute of Art. A very, very, very special curator. He did projects, crazy projects. Like it reminds me of um, of Harold Zeman, who was a, a Swiss curator, who, who who likewise I think believed in a, a very optimistic power of of art in an avant-garde sense. And he did a Vandermark did a project called Art by Telephone. Um, he did a project called Pictures to Be Read and Poetry to Be Seen. These these really fabulous. Uh, exhibitions that were about um, testing the limits, I think, of people's uh, ability or, or, or desire for contemporary art in their lives. Um, so he was the founding director. Uh, the museum opened in this Philip Johnson Plaza in January of 1984, so just a half a year after the Christo project. And, and this is not necessarily known as one of Philip Johnson's greatest projects. It's, it's rather brutalist. It's um, a plaza that has many different kinds of styles running through it. Uh, but it is a very public place. Uh, today, the building is used as um, a part of the Museum of Miami History. Um, but at that time, it was situated directly across the street from the government center, you know, literally where commissioners are, where the mayor is. And so there was this sense, I think, of a very uh, civic um, kind of idea or opportunity. Of course, in a place where you don't have, mm, I hate to say it like this, but you don't have what we would consider to be treasures of, of art, then you have to make it. You have to create these projects that are, are doing that and are pushing forward an idea and I think working from a point almost of necessity. So this idea that he would come in and do this project that was about bringing people together at, at its essence uh, makes perfect sense. Um, the first show that Vandermark did at the museum, the show that opened the museum, was this exhibition called In Quest of, of Excellence. Um, and, and it was a show that, uh, obviously, at a museum, uh, uh, still at that time, called the Center for Fine Arts. So not even, not even, not even feeling courageous enough to take on the, the name of, of being a museum. But the Center for Fine Arts did an exhibition that came from uh, 60 different uh, museums all around the country, including yours. Um, it's, it's the way, I think, to introduce this idea that museums are important and that the things inside of them are important and provide a specific civic place for people to come together. Um, one of the pieces that actually did make the cut that was from Miami is this Dwayne Hansen sculpture. 
uh, this wonderful piece that is at the low. And of course, in 1981, as uh, in, in the, the glow of the Miami Dolphins of the 1970s, this is a, a work that is treasured throughout our city. Um, your beautiful Morris Lewis from upstairs was in the exhibition. And, and it was actually, it was, it was there with the Robert Henry and also with that amazing Giacometti. So all of these things coming in from all over the place are kind of the introduction to what the possibilities might be. And I think interestingly, and this is something that, that, that had to be grappled with by um, the institution and directors in its immediate wake was that you saw the cover image, right? It was a French helmet from the 18th century. The show was about different things and there was a diversity of objects. So this, the, the, the Lewis was one of several modern pieces, but there was a real um, exchange of, of different kinds of things. I'm, I'm happy that, that after, maybe after people saw the wonderful uh, Lewis from, from the Des Moines Art Center, they thought, now we gotta get us some of that. So <laughs> we, we did, and, and we have three amazing Morris Lewis paintings right now, actually, um, uh, we've, we've had all of them up within the, the scope of the last year and are very, very important to the collection. And I also just, I would note that, you know, the three of an artist, I just walked past that wall of Tanner's, um, for us to have three of these Lewises is a big deal. It's, it's a significant um, kind of commitment. Our, we, we do not have what one would say is depth around um, modernism. We're trying to change that, but it's, it, these are pretty important. In this subsequent time, um, there were several monographic exhibitions that came into the museum. And, and, and Vandermark, as I mentioned, being um, somewhat of an avant-gardist, I think, you know, was trying to, to, to do things, to, to bring people into the museum as we are wont to do, um, and also sort of carving a path that was also quite conservative in a way for somebody uh, who had worked so deeply in conceptualism. So you see here some of those early exhibitions, Miro, Picasso, names we know. Um, but one sticks out, and this Jesus Rafael Soto um, was a project that happened at the museum in 1985, and one that we are very much engaged in right now. Um, we have a large Soto piece that you'll see that sits outside on, on the grounds at this point in time. And I think it also was one of the few early shows that said, hold up, we have to do things a little bit different here. We have to think about this a little bit differently while we are interested in showing histories, um, canonical histories around art, we also have to um, be aware of where we are. And this idea of being centered, you know, as part of the Caribbean, as being a northern point uh, to Latin America is essential for us. And we take this lead, but uh, take it even further. I just want to show you another, pro this project by Klaus Oldenburg was directly across the street from the museum and sits there today and is a working fountain, um, a pretty amazing piece. Uh, but again, this, this kind of art that is large scale, monumental, public, about even about use, about being utilitarian in some way, it's a fountain in a very, very hot place. Um, Next to that, eh, on the in the library, which is also on the plaza where the museum was, you have Ed Ruscha's very first public installation. And I should mention, we, we, these projects came about because of a program called Art in Public Places, um, which is run by a man named Michael Spring and has been for quite some time, which was the progressive way of talking about contemporary art in Miami before there was any um, art fair or anything of that sort. So, of course, we could not resist trying to tap into this conversation last year on the 35th anniversary of Christo and Jean-Claude's Surrounded Islands. 
So we redid the entire um, exhibition and what it is a traveling uh, kind of exhibition that had only been seen in Europe and Japan. And we redid the exhibition in our galleries. And within this early history of, of art in Miami, I also have to point out um, uh, differences in terms of, of cultural differences. Um, the painting on the left, Amelia Pelaez, uh, painting that is now in the, the, the MoMA, um, in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, she actually was a part of the one of the very earliest uh, exhibitions on Cuban artists, which was 1944, a uh, show of modern Cuban painters at MoMA. And she was, the, I think, the lone woman in that exhibition, along with 10 or 11 men. Um, she's a giant. And she's one of these artists that, if you look at most canonical histories, you might not see her. You might miss her. And this is the kind of work that we have been um, interested in changing and in doing, um, trying to actually rewrite canons of art history. Um, I put the Palayas there, and you see this, uh, this article about arts exhibit dispute splits Miami Cubans. Um, the man in the picture is Ramon Cernuda, who has a wonderful gallery called Cernuda Arte in Miami, in Coral Gables now. And you see a Palayas down on the floor. Um, they, a museum, you know, while there was no uh, Miami Art Museum or Center for Fine Arts in 1982, there was a Cuban Museum for Art and Culture. And they showed modern artists, and they showed a lot of artists who were Cubans who were already in Miami. But I tend to believe, as Ramon did then, that if you're going to show Cuban art, then you have to be open to showing artists who are on the island still, or islands, or, or artists like Amelia Pelias, who never left, um, alongside of artists who did, right? It, it, we look at things in a more international diasporic way at this point. Well, that caused a lot of disagreement. There were two pipe bombs at the museum in 1988. Um, one of them under the car of, of one of the, the, the directors, uh, another one at the door. So, so clearly, you're, you're in a place where art matters in a really big way, right? Um, and, and there are sensitivities around this idea. Palaez, many people did not want this work to be seen. Um, in the end, and after a lot of time, uh, they, that museum ended up closing. Sir Nudo is actually uh, investigated by um, the US federal government for a considerable amount of time. And, and, and in some ways, I think it was kind of payback for him being uh, a, a, a proponent of this idea that, that they should be able to show the work of, of all Cuban artists and not those, just those who had left. This comes up in our conversations today, and, and, and I'll, I'll show you in a way that it does. In 1995, Suzanne Delahanty became the director of the museum and, and kind of, for the first time, I thought, I think gave us a, a sort of path forward. Prior to that, it was not only those shows of modern painters that um, you saw, but it was also shows that included European goldsmiths, the Silk Road, African adornment, Northwest Coast Indian art, Art Deco, Power and Gold, Oriental Porcelain, Fabergé Treasures, everything. And, and so obviously it's hard to define oneself when you're trying to do everything. Um, Suzanne came in and came from the, the ICA Philadelphia. She had been director there. She had been director at the Newberger Museum in New York, and she had been a director at the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston. So obviously had a lot of ideas and, and really um, put the museum on a path, I think, forward. She changed the name almost within a year from the Center for Fine Arts to Miami Art Museum. Um, changed that name, of course, in uh, concert with our board of trustees at that time. You know, so obviously there is this, this idea to, um, to be something bigger, uh, to me something perhaps 
more meaningful in the world, to make um, shows rather than just take shows and to send um, intellectual uh, content around. So it was huge for her to do that. And although she did not, you know, in, in this quote I used to, to exhibit, collect, preserve, yeah, we, we are all doing that. And, but she takes things a lot further. And one of the first exhibitions that happened in the, at the museum under her watch um, was this exhibition, Sacred Arts of Vodou. And it was a massive, massive exhibition that came from the Fowler at UCLA, um, you know, in Los Angeles but obviously had to come to Miami. And uh, while I mentioned you know, the, the histories around Cuban migration, which we all are aware of, you know, the Haitian population in Miami is, is likewise a very large and very important um, population. And so you can see here how the museum is making uh, overtures that are outside of its normal confines. Um, I like to keep the map because I think it's, uh, it, it also centers us in a way, and you know we we do work with a lot of um, artists within that map specifically. Um, we consider ourselves to be yes a museum of international, modern, and contemporary art, but one that wants to be the best at presenting the work of Latin America and the Caribbean, and we look toward the African diaspora is how we define it now. Uh, another image from that show. Um, she also brought in an exhibition, Global Conceptualism, Points of Origin, 1950s to 1980s, um, which, which furthered many ideas uh, going back to, I think, some of uh, Vandermark's uh, position around conceptualism and, and this idea that the art should um, speak to the issues that are out there in the world. And, and always, I think that is what um, then takes us into these questions where, you know, as, Al as Allison talked about in her talk, you know, issues around Sam Durant's scaffold or issues around Dana Schutz and her treatment of, of Emmett Till and a painting that was then uh, a big um, point of, 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 of disagreement um, at the last Whitney Biennial, you know, to think about those sort of projects. Um, she also brought in a very large exhibition called Beyond Geometry, uh, which really looked at abstraction and its relationship to geometry, but through a much more uh, Latin American lens than, than had been to that point, including artists like Hilio Orisica, Silda Morales, um, and many artists who were dealing um, with these ideas from the concrete movement. A, a big thing that um, for us has been quite important is her relationship to collections because not only did the name change, but we became a collecting institution in 1994. And, and, and that really, um, Suzanne was a big part of that. She had a very close relationship with Charles Coles and with Jan Coles, his mother, uh, who was, is an a, a emeritus trustee of the museum. Um, so collections began coming in and, and donations began coming in. One thing that is a significant part of the collection is our photography collection, um, which you know, for us is, is 400 and some odd pieces, um, but works that span into, back into the 19th century uh, and give us a position to speak across time um, with a level of depth that we cannot in other ways. So you see uh, Steichen taking us back to uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Man, right? And yet pulling us into to the present with uh, Cindy Sherman, um, or at least pulling us into the, the, the 1980s. Um, we have thought about these this work in many different ways over time. And, and when the building opened, which I'll talk about in a second, um, did an exhibition that was all about the Coles collection and about looking at uh, that earlier exhibition, but also looking at the way that Charles Coles, who was this collector, um, patron, um, and even curator, the way that he had actually assembled the work in his own uh, gallery setting and trying to mimic that, if you will. One of the first pieces that, that, not one of, but the first piece of art that was actually purchased by the museum was Lorna Simpson, still from 1997. And I think that in, is, is a remarkable in the context of 
how we think about an entry point into collecting, right? So our entry point is the mid-1990s in the wake of things like uh, you know, the, the Whitney Museum exhibition of 1993, which was considered to be the sort of height of, of, of multiculturalism and, and sort of plurality of ideas um, and, and a discussion of diversity that you know, we can't lose sight of now while it has become such a, a hot word again. Um, Lorna had an exhibition at the museum in 1997 as well and is somebody that we actually honored a few years ago uh, at our gala. But to have her be the jump off point for where your collection begins and acquisition wise is a fascinating position to be in and one that we try to, to heighten. Um, one of the ways that we do that is we actually have an affiliate group uh, called the Ambassadors for the Fund for African American Art and, and picks up off of the fact that this was already such an integral part of the collecting experience of the museum. Um, also around that time, Alfredo Yar, uh, a logo for America, a piece that really in many ways defines us. You know, this idea that, that he's getting at as uh, America, um, who's America? Uh, South America, North America, and, and, and we're constantly playing with that idea, hence the title, um, constantly trying to, to trouble that space, if you will. Um, Anna Mendieta, obviously super important uh, to our collection and to the conversations that we're having. Um, a woman who was at the height of uh, performance art before she, she died um, early. But these photographs are, it's a series, part of a series of 16 photographs that are often on view. Um, Jose Bedia, uh, uh, artist, uh, Cuban artist who um, was exiled to, in Miami and, and lives there now, and an artist who we continue to have a deep relationship with. Um, and I'm happy to say that in 2008, my exhibition, which like the Vodou show in my mind, had to come to Miami, Neo Hoodoo, Art for a Forgotten Faith, uh, was, uh, although organized in Houston at the Manil Collection, did come to Miami as it, as it needed to be. It was a show about contemporary art and its relationship to spirituality in a broad sense, but also in a very specific sense. All of the artists in the exhibition were drawn from the Americas. Uh, and, and, and taking into account our very specific histories around Manifest Destiny, around colonialism, around um, histories of, of, of cultural history as well. What you see here is a, a halo by James Lee Byers on the right, and then on the cover of the book, a halo by the Brazilian artist Marepi. I think, the, and actually the, the second part of the title, Neo Hoodoo, Art for a Forgotten Faith, came from uh, Ishmael Reed, from the writer Ishmael Reed, and indirectly I was inspired by a book he wrote called Mumbo Jumbo. And Mumbo Jumbo has a lot to do with, um, now, the movie Black Panther. Mumbo Jumbo was about a group of individuals who were going to rescue the works of art that had been taken to the House of Art Detention. And the House of Art Detention exists at 82nd Street and 5th Avenue in New York City, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, so the whole book is a narrative on how we're going to get this colonial booty back, if you will. And, and of course, Black Panther, um, very similar idea, and, and Allison talked about this in, in, in her talk, you know, this, this, this concept that happens in real life around, around permission, right, around cultural permission. Are we showing artifacts in some cases that were never meant to be shown in a museum context? Um, what does it mean to talk about repatriation of art objects? All of these are hot topics for us right now and fictionally fits perfectly into um, this story in Black Panther um, where the figure Killmonger is coming to uh, take back some of those art objects. A um, couple more images from that show, the Marepi on the floor, Nari Ward, a big neon uh, on the wall, um, and then another uh, view from the buyers. And, and artists, uh, the artist, Cuban artist Cacho is, is in the kind of um, wooden piece in the back on the left. 
uh, an artist named Michael Tracy, a big cross that is covered in this kind of material, almost creating like a, a patina um, and, and speaking to this idea of, of Christianity being layered with other things because the exhibition was as much about what happens when you have this coming together of African religion, European religion in the quote unquote new world. Um, where are the synergies? So for us you know, to think about Candomblé in Brazil or Santeria in Haiti or uh, Vodun in Haiti or Santeria in Cuba, you know, these places where you, you have developed um, ideas around spirituality and religion that are solely about synergy, that are about bringing these two varied elements together. Um, Brian Jungin on the right, it looks like a potentially a Northwest Coast totem pole, but it's made out of golf bags. Um, Radcliffe Bailey uh, down on the floor, a piece that's made out of keyboards, uh, or not keyboards, but the keys, piano keys, um, which he considers to be almost like the, the sea of, of this ship um, coming, potentially a slave ship. And you see the, the figure of um, Shango, uh, a Yoruban god, in the back corner uh, as if the boat is leaving from there. Um, and there's our, our friend Jose Badia down on the floor in front of a pretty amazing uh, painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat, um, which is one of his more direct text paintings that really talks specifically about colonialism and even writes it inside of the painting. Royal um, Salt Incorporated talking about the commerce of not only commodities but also of people. The new building opened in 2013, so I'm pivoting again. Um, a, a overhead look, and, and the architects are Herzog and de Meuron, and they were very much inspired by um, this place that is in Biscayne Bay, in the south end of Biscayne Bay, and you can see the city in the background, not far off at all, um, called Stiltsville. And these, these houses that were built somewhat off, off necessity in the middle of the water, you know, prepared somewhat for rising tides or for um, hurricanes. And, and they used that as a sort of guiding light for this new building. Um, and then you get a better look. I mean, obviously, uh, it, it was a massive project that began with Suzanne Delahanty in order to uh, come to an agreement with uh, the city and the county uh, to develop this, this building. It's 200,000 square feet, um, 120,000 square feet of gallery space. Um, we have a park adjacent to us and, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at the Papa John Park and, and trying to figure out how in the world are we going to do this? Um, where will we find the wherewithal to do something that amazing? But we have a park right there and it needs to happen, so we'll see. Um, and, and then another view from here. Uh, this is a view from our third floor, uh, looking down on the bay, looking down on um, the steps that go out to the back of the building. Um, I think what's interesting uh, is it is very much a light-filled uh, space. It is, I think, a very inviting space. Takes advantage, obviously, of our weather. And so people can come up. You don't have to pay to get in, necessarily, to come sit on the back. And people come to sit on the water. Um, we have a restaurant off to the side there. Um, it is a place that, in many ways, filled with glass, and so does have this kind of open um, relationship that we're trying to to harness and trying to um, make integral to everything we do is this idea that you know the museum is a civic entity open to all, that we consider ourselves to be a place for dialogue and one that is, is open. Um, so the building really fortifies uh, a lot of those ideas. Uh, view of the auditorium. I think one of the interesting um, elements of the building inside is that the auditorium is put directly in the middle of the building. So you have to traverse it in order to get to the second floor um, where most of the galleries are. Um, it, it, obviously, you're looking on the right, top right, you're looking up 
into the second floor and then looking down from the left. And there's a little bridge area for, for the good nights when we're packed like we are on the right. Um, that's a convening of the Fund for African American Art, which tend, does tend to draw uh, an audience like that annually. Another view from inside. And, and when we opened, um, we, we opened with you know, a permanent collection that was about a little over 1,500 objects. And, and some things, obviously, that came in right around that time, including this, this work by Hugh Locke, which has probably been up three years out of the five that we've now been in the building. Um, and it's just too perfect. Uh, it sits directly as you walk into the building. The entrance is just off to the side, to the left here. And this per piece sits perfectly there. It just came down last week. And, um, and I know already I have trustees who are upset, um, but it'll be back. Um, you can make out some of the Ai Weiwei sculptures in the background. And the first exhibition that opened the museum, I think uh, at that time was uh, Ai Weiwei's traveling exhibition. And you know, the, one of the things that I think we, we're constantly um, thinking about, especially in places, um, you know, not, not New York, not Chicago, like those huge places, but is the, how do you work with local um, community, local artists? We are here to support that. Um, one artist in Miami did not think we were demonstrating our support of that conversation when we opened the museum and decided to pick up one of the Weiwei pots and drop it on the floor. Um, that, these things happen rarely in our museums, um, but it happened at that time, and you know uh, that was dealt with. Um, we also then opened with uh, Amelia Pelayas, and an immediate conversation to kind of resuscitate this idea around this incredibly powerful um, woman uh, artist who had a strange uh, history um, with art in Miami. No problems there. Uh, Edward Duval Carrier, uh, who I understand is coming to Iowa in a couple of weeks, to Waterloo. Next weekend to Waterloo. Um, Duval Carrier, uh, I, I hate to, to, to make the combination, but his presence in Miami like that of Badia is one of uh, just, almost like a guiding light and somebody who has been so influential upon a generation of artists for the last 20 some odd years. He's a giant. If you fly into Miami on Delta, you will see his work at the airport in the terminal. Um, but somebody has been incredibly important to, to that city. Um, Caribbean, Crossroads of the World, very early on exhibition, again, stating our purpose um, and our relationship to our region. Um, in the foreground here is a work by Ilya Alba. On the left is Ebony Patterson. In the middle is a Belki Seyon in black and white. Um, shortly after that, uh, Firle Baez, a uh, younger um, artist who is now receiving a lot of recognition, but I think also one of the places where we try to be effective is in showing um, certain artists for the very first time and, and doing significant catalogs on those artists, and Firle is one of them, somebody whose uh, family is from Dominican Republic and Haiti, and whose work touches on issues within those spaces. So it was, it, it was a great show for us. It was one of those exhibitions where it was also was about traveling shows and creating intellectual history, creating scholarship. Um, wonderful exhibition. Uh, Nari Ward, a uh, big solo exhibition uh, at the end of 2015, and you know, just had a show at the New Museum, um, but this is four years ago now that we had his first large survey. Uh, artist originally from Jamaica who's been in Brooklyn for many, many years. Large installation pieces, big relationship to Arte Povera. Um, Doris Salcedo, an exhibition that originated at the MCA in Chicago, one that we felt had to come to Miami. Um, you know, an uh, artist, a woman from Colombia whose work deals with the uh, atrocities that happened there under the dictatorship in the 70s and 80s. Um, tough show, 
I think, a tough show for a lot of people to enter into. You see what you're seeing here, these dressers and pieces of furniture that are filled with cement, um, very um, powerful works, but also works that are somewhat mute. Um, Jean-Michel Basquiat, um, although we do not have him in the collection, we almost claim him as, as our own. If you're in Miami on 54th Street, which is in Little Haiti, you will come across no, uh, no less than three murals on the sides of buildings of Jean-Michel Basquiat, an artist who, of course, is born in Brooklyn, but born there to a Haitian father and a Puerto Rican mother. Um, an artist that we, we showed this small show from the Brooklyn Museum, the Notebooks exhibition, and we added several pieces to it, but it is one of those exhibitions that for us and for Miami, you know, really had a very, very, very powerful resonance. Um, you see a little bit of the work there, and a room of works that actually are in Miami collections is something that we added to that show. Um, here, Julio Le Parc, uh, a big exhibition in uh, 2017 uh, that looked at the, the very important work of this uh, Venezuelan artist who has been primarily in uh, Paris and talked about uh, art and color and kinetic uh, work as well. Um, this large piece was the end point of that exhibition. Um, Moving into 2018, a uh, show that I uh, organized along with our assistant curator, Jennifer Inacio. Um, and this is an exhibition that I believe to revisit every four years while the World Cup is going on. Um, in this case, we call it the World's Game, Football and Contemporary Art. Back in 2006, Trevor Schoonmaker from the Nasher uh, in North Carolina and I did a show called The Beautiful Game uh, in, in Brooklyn at uh, Roebling Hall Gallery and in Chelsea at Roebling Hall Gallery and have been exploring the theme constantly ever since. Um, looking inside of the exhibition and through a piece by a video piece by the artist Stephen Dean looking onto Vic Muniz's collage of Pelé. Um, a work by a LA artist named Lyndon Barwa, which is a, a clay animation piece of different highlights of important events in soccer that have happened over the last 50 years. Um, on the left is a video uh, of Brandy Chastain as a claymation figure, um, famously taking off her shirt when the women won the World Cup um, a dozen years ago. Um, of course, you know, the, the, the women being the absolute idea, the standard of excellence in the sport. Um, here, a large piece by the Brazilian artist Nelson Lerner that is filled with uh, deities from the Yoruban uh, religion uh, around the sides of this arena, which is Mar called Maracanã, which is the biggest, or was the biggest uh, stadium in Rio. Um, a video piece by Robin Rhoda on the left and a painting by Maria Lasnig on the right. And, and most of all of this show, I mean, because, you know, I think one of the things that we're, you know, constantly um, talking about or dealing with, I try not to talk about it too much, and attendance, right, you know, is how do you drive attendance? Um, and we're a museum that uh, charges. We have an admission fee of $16. And so, you, you, you know, we, we think about this. And, I, and, and I'm not sure, you know, how, how are we going to deal with that in the future? We shall see. Um, but it helps when the best football player in, in England, Leroy Sané, comes from Manchester City, whose team won the championship last year, comes to the, to the actual exhibition. There's no better publicity, um, except for maybe Brandy Chastain coming to the exhibition as well and literally pointing to herself inside of a work of art. So th that was fun. Community. I'm just going to run through a few things because right, I want to get to questions. Um, and, and I saw, you know, as much as I don't want to talk about attendance, I think it's important to note that when the building opened uh, in 2013, well, it opened in the December of 13, so you have to go to 2014. Uh, over, you know, fivefold of, of, of attendance, of people coming into the actual, of being able to share experiences and to share a space for dialogue with more people, most importantly. 
Um, some of, you know, we, we have many education programs as, as is our purpose. Um, I'd say that 85% of what we do is based around education programs. And luckily we do have the Knight Foundation in Miami, which has been um, our, one of our biggest supporters. One program that I'm super proud of is the PAM Student Pass, which gives a free membership to every kid inside the Miami-Dade County public school system. Um, they are allowed to come with, with one um, parent or guardian anytime, and they are a real part of our membership base. There are about 8,000 of them at this point. Of course, we are in the fourth largest uh, public school system, so we're just trying to bring in more and more of those kids. Um, and, and one other I just want to make more note of, Art Detectives. And this is a program, I mean, you know, obviously issues around uh, police brutality, around police and relationships, particularly to black bodies, has been very much part of conversations in museums. Um, one way that we've widened the scope of the conversation is to be in uh, collaboration with the school system and Miami-Dade County um, uh, police uh, who come in and do this program with kids which is basically an artist education program where they're learning with our artist educators and looking at art and looking at tough art you know you might not see it here but looking at, at, at tough pieces that, that that lead to conversations that I think shrink the the bridges or the, the space between people um, so that's a big one uh, teen arts council and uh, of course, it's a good place for yoga. Um, and, and I would just end with, uh, you know, one of the things that um, is uh, uh, so much a part of all we do is, is, is social media. And so uh, Instagram, I think uh, my, my former boss, Michael Govan, said something recently to the effect of, you know, we define ourselves by where we, pos where we put ourselves. And, and so this idea of, putting one inside of the frame with art is something that we're constantly um, striving to do. And, and I was gonna end there, but I just wanna com comment on one thing that um, was a little bit in terms of this idea around what we deal with in the present. In, um, in July of, of 2016, so I had been there less than a year, and uh, one of our um, uh, store employees put a, a uh, little paper sculpture kind of project thing um, in our shop. You know, and you see the George Washington one there. It looks relatively innocent, but the idea of doing Che Guevara in Miami is not a good one at all. Um, so those are the kind of quotes that were in not, you know, little places, but actually in the Miami Herald. Um, I wrote a extensive uh, mea culpa editorial um, it was removed immediately. And what it did, it allowed us then to embark on a year of stories that were generated with uh, the Cuban community and with exiles in particular. And also, I'd have to say, in particular, with our commissioners. So we get about 20% of our funding. We are a $16 million budget. We get about 20% from Miami-Dade County. That Miami-Dade County is comprised of 13 commissioners and one mayor. So I walked into the meeting at the beginning of the fiscal year for 17-18 and sat in awe as they took away a half a million dollars. No, no, five, they took away 500, yes, $500,000, okay. They took away half a million dollars of the only four that we get and gave it to a uh, initiative called the Cuban Museum, which is barely functioning. Um, and it, it was relatively shocking, and it is the world in which we live. Uh, so in the year following that, we also happened to do, and it was already happening, a year-long series of three iterations of a Cuban art exhibition of contemporary art in which we brought everybody in beforehand, engaged them in conversations, had artists who lived on the island, who even came to the opening, and had artists who lived in exile. And everything went perfectly. So what was a horrible thing turned into um, a pretty good thing. And I'm gonna end there. Thank you.
Um, you were talking about something I didn't quite understand. It was with Amelia, I think it was with that Amelia. Amelia Pelias? Yeah, and you said that there was a lot of controversy yeah. over art that was from Cuba and people that were still in Cuba or not in Cuba. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what that, because sure. what that controversy is? Sure. Amelia Pelias um, was a fantastic artist, one who traveled, who was a a modernist who spent time in Europe and after Fidel Castro came to power in 1959 stayed in Cuba for the rest of her life and lived there. Um, it is the belief that if you are bringing that work and presenting it then you are actually in effect supporting the revolution and that would be contrary to the, co the Cuban community that makes up Miami. And so for them to say, that was, the, that was basically the gist, is that you cannot show the work of an artist who did not leave, because if they didn't leave, then it means they believed. And that was the problem. Um, for us now, you know, this, I'm talk that, that happened in 1988. So it was a very, very different time, only eight years after the Mariel boat lived. Very different time. So it would be, it's totally dealt with differently now, and it's why we decided to have a show of her work when the museum opened. I hope that makes it clear. Uh, Laura, we have a question back there. This goes along with that and that last slide you showed about how you decide or how you prepare for the potential outrage that anything might, you might unexpectedly produce? Well, I, I think in a, in a general sense, you know, and, and we, we do it now as museums a lot, and I don't know if you were here for James Rondeau's talk, but James spoke about uh, these, are they pots? Right? There was a big show, and I'm forgetting the name, Nimbra or something like that. These pots that they were about to show. And the, the possession of those pots is one that has been a very um, uh, ongoing conversation. Like, do you have the right to show something that was never supposed to be shown in a museum? These things were made for ritual. They were made to be used. So who are you to say that you can actually show them in, a, in your museum? And so what he talked about was embarking upon a series of in-depth conversations with people who were from that um, cultural group and making sure it was going to be okay to do the show. If I'm not mistaken, they postponed the, the exhibition. They did. But it is that kind of thing that we need to be aware of and we need to do. When I was at LACMA at LA County Museum, we showed a series of large uh, sculptures from Mexico, Olmec sculptures. And there were several people who believed, you know, those should not be seen in the context of the museum or they should be discussed in different ways. Um, part of that conversation involved talking about their relationship to African art specifically. And there were many people who, who we knew going in, so we did conversations prior to the exhibition. Likewise, there's a, a piece by Ed Keenholz which pictures, a, 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 not pictures, but it actually physically demonstrates with sculpture a castration um, of a black person by uh, police. Um, and so we knew that, you know, that was going to be an issue. It was part of a big project called Pacific Standard Time, sponsored by the Getty. So we brought people in and we talked about it and, and, and got a lot of um, uh, advice. And so in this case, back to Miami, it, pro it should have never, probably that should not have been there, not in, treated in that way, in my opinion, as, as, as another commodity within you know, something to be sold in that fashion. One thing to talk about these historical facts in the context of an exhibition, but another to have it just as a, a, an item in the gift shop. And we should have been more aware of the sensibility. 
Franklin, I have a question for you. How are you institutionally involving the community's input in your decision making or just in, in your thinking? Are there advisory committees and how are you institutionalizing that process of really hearing the community's voice? Well, we, ha we have a board of 46 people. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. <laughs> And, and there are several committees on that. But what I think we're doing is what we're surrounding ourselves with allies. And as I mentioned, we have you know, 13 county commissioners who we are constantly just trying to show some art to, just trying to come in and let's just talk about the issues that this art engenders. We had up last year, like several museums, we had up a piece by uh, the artist Arthur Jaffa called Love is the Message. And it's a tough piece. I mean, he considers it to be a sort of imagistic history of some of, of treatment of, of black people since, um, since slavery. And, and it's a tough piece, and it makes a lot of issues come up. So we you know, come in and see it and talk about it. So we have uh, 100 and 120 people within the organization already as it is, and a huge group of artist educators who also uh, provide a lot of um, punchback you know, to, to whatever is being discussed as a curatorial program or an exhibition program. But it's an ongoing effort. Thank you. <laughs> and then Allison has a question. And these, it's, they're two really easy questions. Um, <laughs> One is, um, so you said that curatorially you're focusing on the um, African diaspora and Caribbean and Latin American art. Um, is that both exhibitions and collecting? And how did, is that, um, is that an, something that is formalized in any way? Was that something that you worked with the board on deciding to, to yeah. focus on? Yeah. yeah, two years ago we did a strategic plan, mm -hmm. and so it's in our mission, it's in our strategic plan mission okay. that for the first time two years ago, I think we've always had that foundation there, obviously, um, but to say we, we, we think that we can be the best at presenting the work of Latin America and the Caribbean, and we look towards the African diaspora, right. but we remain a museum of international, modern, and contemporary art. Um, we've also developed affiliate groups around that to further the concept and idea. So when the museum opened in 2013, and this reminds me a little bit of that Joan Didion quote, when the museum reopened in 2013 with a new name, Miami Art Museum is now Perez Art Museum Miami, a statement in itself that George Perez and Alberto Ibarguen, who is the head of the Knight Foundation, decided that they were gonna put up a million dollars to create a fund for African-American art. Just to, to think about that within the context, right? We know that the work already exists in a certain way in the collection, but to say, here's a million dollars to build that higher. And that's happening at the same time that you know that you're just, gonna, you're, you just got a gift of 104 works of Latin American art from the Perez collection. So it was an important statement and one that we have just been able to go with really strongly. So that million dollars was spent down to about 300,000. We bought 14 amazing things. An Al Loving that is up in LA right now at Soul of a Nation, a Nari Ward that was just up in New York, a couple other things, a Faith Ring Gold from the 60s, amazing painting. and spend it down and it occurred to me like yeah we have the team that wants to do this right now but what does what does it mean in the future and so we stopped spending the money we said we were going to make it an endowment we brought it up to a million dollars and now it's about two million and we're only spending the proceedings uh, of that you know at about five percent a year so that was one way last year or the year before we did a latino and latin american art fund and that is a group of people who want to be there and talk about that and have a passion for that and want to support the programs. So like this past year, we had Beatriz Gonzalez on view, just came off view. It's about to open in Houston. 
Teresita Fernandez is going to open with us in October. So that commitment has been demonstrated in exhibitions and the programs as well. And it only can happen with the support, I think, of, of those entities. We couldn't just say we're going to do it, but that's how it's happening. We also added an international women's committee, which has been quite effective in that space as well. And that also goes towards programs. So do these groups, that was my second question, so do these groups then, you have specific meetings and do you talk about what kind of acquisitions with them, about yeah. what you want to, okay. Could you but we try, we try to do one thing that is scholarly and one thing that is a little bit more like fun, fun, party kind of. Um, and and it, it seems to be working, but they're a total part of the conversation, like discussing artists, um, discussing uh, exhibitions, uh, so yeah. yeah. All right, we'll take one question here, and then I know we all are like gonna go see Franklin in Miami. <laughs> Please. So one of your slides had a um, Oldenburg sculpture, and it referenced the Dade County Public Art Trust, and it talked about a 1.5% new construction donation, and that's 1984. Yeah. We can't get that in Des Moines. So I'm wondering, do you know the history of that, and are you a part of it now? Does it still exist? So what it has morphed into is art in public places, and um, it is run by this guy named Michael Spring, who happens to be, who works for the mayor of the county. And they have a large group of people from civic group that comes together and, and talks about these projects and it exists in a big way and continues to to function and there are like like that work is part of its collection um as well as the ruche the the big that library commission is 40 something paintings it's absolutely phenomenal i couldn't believe it you know, like you walk into the library and it's just lined around the ceiling um, it's incredible, but that is how. And yes, there, there is a percentage um, that goes into that every year. We're trying to do the same thing with the city. My, we get nothing from the city right now. Well, that seems like a really down note to end on. I don't know, yeah, should no. we say, all right, great. One more down here, let's go down here. <laughs> it's happening though. It is, that's true. We can't, even though it's down, we, can't, we have to acknowledge that it's happening. Yeah, hi. So um, we're here with a class from the University of Iowa that's called Spanish in the U.S. And um, one of the questions that I ask the students to prepare uh, to come here is the question of what role, if any, language plays in a museum. Um, and I had a lot of different answers, everything from uh, a n no, no role at all. They actually expect you to be quiet to a huge role in terms of access and things like that. And I couldn't help but notice that you do have some bilingual um, facades next to some of the pieces, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about generally what role you think that should play in museums, and also then in your museum, is that widespread in terms of the bilingual nature, or is that specific to certain exhibi exhibitions or artists? Oh, for us, everything is bilingual. Um, catalogs, labels, brochures, everything. When we did the Basquiat show, we added Creole. Um, if you go into the city hall, usually it's English, Spanish, and Creole, uh, Haitian Creole. So we, we don't do the Haitian Creole with every uh, show, but we do do bilingual for every piece of, of thing that we generate. Um, and yeah, happy that we were one of the first to, to make that um, part of our program. It is, it is crucial, crucial for us. Um, I mean, 70% of, of our city speaks Spanish. Yeah. Thank Everyone, you for that, and thanks for being here. Yes, thank, let us thank Franklin for his visit. Thank you and your, and your thank talk. Thank you. Thank you.